Sir? Potter's Field, yeah. 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 <laughs> type of hell, it's a type of hell. It's Gehenna, city dump down, is down there at the bottom of that hill. Brother, uh, can we go back to verse 16 a moment? All right. Where he's talking about the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David, concerning Judas, where will we find that? Where is that at? Did somebody say Psalm 41? 41.9. Yeah, that's one reference, but there's a better one than that. That's mine own familiar friend in whom I trusted did eat of my bread, lifted the seal against me. That's one, but there's a better one than that later. I want the one that says, uh, let his house be desolate. And here, here's the one, Psalm 55, begin at verse 12. This is, this is better than Psalm 41. Psalm 55, beginning at verse 12. For it was not an enemy that reproached me, that I could have borne it. Neither was it he that hated me, that did magnify himself against me, that I would have hid myself from him. But it was thou a man mine equal, my guide, and mine acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together and walked into the house of God in company. Uh, let death seize upon them, let them go down quick into hell for wickedness among their dwellings and among them. There's a better one than that. I haven't got the one yet. Yeah. Yes, it is. And it, anything on Judas will match the Antichrist. Right on through. Uh, what? I want the one that, that says, uh, it's in the Psalms. Uh, there, that sounds like it. It's over there later. That's it there. All right, Psalm 69. Psalm 69, 25, the fulfillment that Peter is talking about when he talks about Judas losing his, his power. Let their habitation be desolate. Let none dwell in their tents. No, that isn't quite it yet. <laughs> yeah. You're right, that is, but I've got something else in mind here somewhere. That's a direct quotation. You're right, that does match Acts, but I've got something else in mind. There, that's so late in there. It's so over late. That's it. There it is. That's it. You watch this one come through. Now, this is it. Psalm 109, verse 7, verse 6. Set thy wicked man over him, and let Satan stand at his right hand. When he should be judged, let him be condemned. Let his prayer become sin. Let his days be few, and let another take his office. That's it. Let his children be fatherless, his widow, uh, his wife a widow. Let his children be continually vagabonds and beg. Let them seek their bread out of their desolate places. Let the extortioner catch all that he hath. Let the stranger spoil his labor. Let there be none to extend mercy to him. Neither let there be any to favor his fatherless children. Let his posterity be cut off, and the generation following, let their name be blotted out. Let the iniquity of his fathers be remembered with the Lord, and let not the sin of his mother be blotted out. Verse 17, as he loved cursing, so let it come unto him. As he delighted not in blessing, so let it be far from him. As he clothed himself with cursing like a garment, so let it come into his bowels like water and like oil into his bones. Now, how'd you like to have the Lord pray in that one for you? Now, that's the Lord Jesus Christ praying. That's what you call an imprecatory psalm. And imprecatory means, I-M-P-R-E-C-A-T-O-R-Y, means a prayer for vengeance or wrath, and a liberal hates those kind of prayers. He don't believe God do a nasty thing like that. But that's just not David praying, that's the Lord Jesus Christ praying against Judas. Amen. Boy, you think about the Lord praying for you or against you, he's praying for us. How'd you like to have him praying against you? And saying, God, give it to him. Give it to him. Let him have it. Tear up his home. Tear up his family. Kill all his kids. Clothe him with cursing. Put him in hell. Put coals of fire on him. Good night, man. <laughs> yes. There's no indication he was one of the 12 tribes that I can find. He's a man of Kerioth, and Kerioth is in Moab. Was he 
Uh, Zebulun, they may have, they were all Galileans, but there's more than one tribe up there, but they were all Galileans. Well, Cain and Judas, all types of Antichrist, they're all connected. It, it'll come on any unsaved man eventually. I mean, uh, by thy words thou shalt be justified, as he loved cursing, so let it come unto him. As he clothed himself with cursing like a garment, all our righteous are as filthy rags. Yeah, picture, picture of it on to say, any adversary of Christ, boy, that's how she's going to wind up. Glad I'm on the right side. Amen. Acts chapter 1, we'll finish it up here, verse uh, 17. For he was numbered with us and obtained part of this ministry. Psalm 41, Psalm 55, and Psalm 100 and, what was it, 4? 109. Now this man purchased a fee with the reward of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. And it was known to all the dwellers at Jerusalem, insomuch as that field is called in their proper tongue, that is the local dialect, Aseldama. It's a Syrian, Aramaic word. Aseldama, that is to say, the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms. Now, where's that quotation from? 69? That's 69. Let his habitation be desolate, let no man dwell therein. And his bishop prick let another take. And the word is the, the uh, old English for the uh, area that a bishop has charge of, that he runs. Diocese is the Roman Catholic word. Wherefore, these men which have accompanied us with all the time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John and the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. So they're going to get a replacement for Judas, so they'll have the twelve required. And they have to have twelve required, because Christ said, Ye which have followed me in my temptations shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So they've got to have twelve apostles. And they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. Look at there, there's a fellow with three names, Joseph, Barsabbas, Justice, the same man. Well, that's it. Paul's an oddball. He's a 13th apostle. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the way that thing works out is Paul's outside the 12. He has a little different commission and a different revelation given to him. And he said, one born out of due time, at a different time, the rest of them. And he compares himself with the twelve, with the three. Now, I'll show you another way you know it couldn't be Paul. Because when James has his head cut off in Acts chapter 12, do they choose another replacement? They don't. See? They fix that number 12. Once that number 12 is fixed there, it never gets changed again for Paul or James or anybody. I'll tell you something else peculiar about Paul. He wrote 13 epistles. I'll tell you something else, Peter, about him. The worst thing he ever wrote for a liberal was 1 Corinthians 13. There would probably more people stumble to hell in 1 Corinthians 13 in place in the New Testament so outside of Acts 2 and Matthew. So Paul writes in some of his epistles things to be hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do the other scriptures of their own destruction. Yeah. There are fellows who've been there ever since the ministry of John the Baptist. Well, there's 13 is always unlucky or bad about it. But in the time, I come to all 13, write, write 13, and 1 Corinthians 13 messed up a lot Well, it may be good for a Christian, and it's bad news for a liberal, and it's bad news for a Roman Catholic. The reason why all liberals and Roman Catholics reject the Word of God is they go by Peter instead of Paul. Paul's a stumbling block to them. Now, if the division that close, but his commission is to Gentiles, and their commission. Yes. 
And not one other, not one other apostle says that. All right, well, let's finish it up. 24, And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship, from which Judas by transgression fell, watch it carefully, that he might go to his own place. We'll study that more next time. To his own place. It's not hell. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. So you have the twelve, and then Paul's an oddball. Paul was born out of due time. He's a number thirteen. How were uh, people saved when Acts 1 and Acts 7? <laughs> They're saved by believing the preaching of the, the gospel that the twelve apostles preached, and... They couldn't get the Holy Spirit unless they were baptized in water. Peter said, Be baptized, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 8, when they were half Jew and half Gentile. Right, right. Part of the what? No. How to, how to? Well, it, you'll have to go one step at a time and take you through. You see, in Acts chapter 2, they've got to be baptized get the Holy Ghost. In Acts chapter 8, they get baptized and still don't get the Holy Ghost. And in Acts chapter 10, they get the Holy Ghost without being baptized. I'll tell you a good, safe verse to go by. Acts 16.31. When you get up in there, you know where you're at. No, sir. No one of the converts did. None of the twelve apostles were ever baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of sins. Not a one of them. Right? In other words, all twelve apostles went to hell if the church of Christ is right. Church of Church Christ Rise, not one of the apostles ever got saved. No apostle was ever baptized, according to Acts 2.38. All right, take a break. All right, Acts 2. Acts 2, <laughs> verse 1. Now you're heading into the toughest part of the Bible. Probably more people going to hell in Acts 2 and other places in the Bible, and probably more... Christian messed up Max to the any of the 35 chapters. So we'll have to go slow and watch what we're doing. On right, Acts 2 1. And when the day of Pentecost, that's the first block right there. Somebody said Pentecost is an experience. It's not an experience at all. It's a Jewish feast. Come back to Leviticus 23. Pentecost. Pentecost is the Greek word for 50. Come back to Leviticus 23. The beginning of 23, beginning at verse 15. This is the anniversary of the giving of the law, and it's 50 days from the resurrection of Christ. Leviticus 23, 15. And you shall count to you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheep of the wave over offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. How many days is that? 49. Even the morrow after the seventh Sabbath. What number day would that be? Fifty. Uh, the number after the Sabbath shall you number fifty days, and you shall offer a new meat offering to the Lord. You shall bring out of your habitation two wave loaves of two tenth deals. They shall be a fine flour. They shall be bacon with leaven. Underline it. The Passover couldn't be offered with leaven, but the Feast of First Fruits is offered with leaven. Because there's sin in the body of Christ. The Passover has no leaven. The Passover lamb is sinless. But the body of Christ made up of Jew and Gentile, it's not sinless. Look at verse 17. You shall bring forth out of your habitation how many? Two wave loaves. There were Gentile proselytes of Judaism in Acts chapter 2 that received the Holy Spirit. Two wave loaves. 
They shall be a fine flour, they shall be baken with leaven. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. Now that feast is called the feast of the first fruits and other pastures. For example, let's turn to Deuteronomy sixteen sixteen. Deuteronomy sixteen sixteen. It comes fifty days after the resurrection, and it's called the feast of first fruits. Deuteronomy sixteen sixteen. Yes. Jew and Gentile, together. That's what that means. Yep, in one group. Two of them put together. Deuteronomy 16, 16. Three times in a year shall all thy males appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose. One, in the feast of unleavened bread, there's the Passover. Two, in the feast of weeks, there's Pentecost. Three, in the feast of tabernacles, those three feasts. They're called the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Feast of Weeks. All right, uh, let's go to Acts 2 now. Acts 2, verse 1. Now, he was on the earth forty days, speaking things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and then he told them to tarry and wait at Jerusalem until they got the power, which means he was there forty days and went back, and they had to wait ten more days before the Holy Spirit came. Forty days after his resurrection or after the crucifixion? After the resurrection. Uh, Acts 1, verse 3, to whom he showed himself alive, being seen of them forty days. So that thing comes fifty days after the resurrection, and that day of Pentecost is the day that God appointed to send the Holy Spirit. And he never sent it again on any Pentecost since. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, it's, uh, go back there to, uh, to Leviticus 23, and notice there's another one stuck in there three days between them. Go back and notice you've got the resurrection there, too. Look at Leviticus 23, and Leviticus 23, look at verse 5. In the fourteenth day of the first month, at the evening of the Lord's Passover. All right, then verse 7, the first day shall have no a holy convocation. And he says in... Uh, Verse 11, and you shall wave the sheep before the Lord to be accepted of you in the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. Then fifty you shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day you brought the sheep of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. So it runs over across there the day after the Sabbath, which is Sunday morning in the resurrection, and then fifty days from there. The crucifixion, resurrection, Pentecost are all dated in the Old Testament, which means as sure as you're sitting here, the rapture and the advent are dated. This sure as you're sitting here. But they'll be in Leviticus when you find them. They won't be in the New Testament. Yes. Uh, this is along the lines of what I've been asked in Leviticus 23 there. It says uh, in verse 10, when you come into the land, I give you all that. Uh, you reap the harvest, you bring the sheep of the first fruits. Mm -hmm. uh, Christ the first fruits. Yeah. First Corinthians 15. Now, which Sabbath is that? That's the first that, Sabbath. After that'll be the regular Sabbath. The first one after the yep. Yep, that'll be the regular Sabbath. All right, Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, and it's fully come, in time, it means more than 6 o'clock in the morning. Uh, for example, look at verse 15. These are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing it is the third hour of the day, 9 o'clock. So the Holy Spirit doesn't come right at the crack of dawn, but at nine o'clock in the morning on that day, and never comes again on any Pentecost ever again at nine, or ten, or eleven, or twelve, any other time. There have been, since this Pentecost here, there have been uh, 1,930 Pentecost. The Holy Spirit doesn't come in any of them. Acts 2.1, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven. All right, the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost is not speaking with tongues. The initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost is a mighty rushing wind. The first evidence of the Holy Spirit's coming is the wind, not the tongues. All right, two, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty rushing wind, and it filled all the house where they were what? Sitting, not kneeling. Sitting. 
And there appeared to them second evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And this isn't tongues either, at least not spoken. There appeared to them. It's something you see. The first thing you hear is wind. The next thing you see is split tongues, cloven tongues, like as a fire. Not fire. Like as a fire. And it, the appearance, what they saw, the, the, the tongues, and it sat upon each of them on the head. Now, you've never been in a tongue meeting like that. And if I run right over First Corinthians and say, well, I do this to edify myself in prayer, but then what's that got to do with the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Amen. Now, you see how people get confused? They get confused by running from something they know isn't so to another place, and then when you trap them there, they run back to the first place. And cults and sects have a way of what they call circular reasoning. The, the mind runs like this. It goes, Camelot goes, Mark 16, 16, Matthew 28, 19, Acts 2, 38, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, Acts 22, 17, Mark 16, 16, Matthew 28, 19, and he's spinning, see? Now, in, in, in regard to that, what I'm saying here is this, and you should get this thing down. Number one, there are no unknown tongues in Acts chapter 2. There are none there. Now, whatever Acts 2 is, I'll tell you what it's not, it's not an unknown tongue. Number two, there is no baptism of the Holy Ghost anywhere in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 where he's talking about an unknown tongue. It isn't anywhere in the chapter. Now, you know what these people have done? They put the two of them together. You can't put the two of them together. Whatever that tongue is in 1 Corinthians 14, it is not a baptism. You say, how do we know that? Because the word isn't in the chapter. That's the best way to spot it. <laughs> and it isn't the chapter before it, and it isn't the chapter after it. So that's pretty good evidence. How do we know these tongues here are not unknown? Because every one of them is named. All right, Acts chapter 2, begin at verse uh, 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. Verse 7. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, on all these which speak Galileans, and how hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born. Parthenians and Medes, Elamites, dwellers in Mesopotamia, in Judea, Cappadocia, Pontia, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya, about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongue. The wonderful works of God. Now, see how that thing goes? And it's a matter of people either believing what God said or judging the Word of God by what they, their experience, what they've been through. And what you've got to do is judge your experience by the Word. Now, if you ever had tongues, there may have been something, there may have not have been something. I'll tell you one thing they weren't. They weren't remotely connected with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. They weren't remotely connected. They weren't connected by 15 books. They're not found anywhere in the, in the book of Acts. The baptism of the Holy Ghost is never accompanied by unknown tongues. Never. It's called other tongues, and they're all listed. There's no, bat, there's no unknown tongue in Acts 2. There's no baptism of the Holy Ghost, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Now, whatever else may be true, may be true, but that's true. All right, now let's pick up Acts 2, verse 3, and watch it again. And there appeared to them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Then in this case here, the filling is the same as the baptism. Now later on, it's not. How do you know it's not later? Let's come to Acts chapter 4. And in Acts chapter 4, let's look at verse uh, 31. And notice the next time they are filled with the Holy Ghost, there's no baptism there. Acts 4, verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and spake with other tongues? No. Spake with an unknown tongue? No. Spake the Word of God with boldness. The characteristic of the Spirit-filled Christian is not his tongue, nobody understands. 
the character, the, the thing that manifests the spirit-filled Christian is the fact that he speaks the word of God boldly. That's the mark of the filling of the Holy Spirit. All right, let's come to Ephesians. And notice that after this time, the filling is not the baptism, because after this time, you're commanded to be filled with the Spirit. Ephesians chapter uh, 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. Ephesians 5, 18. They hear a bunch of people in Christ, and they're given a commandment. And they're told this. Ephesians 5, 18. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. That's a commandment. Now, how do you know that's not the baptism of the Holy Ghost? They already had the Holy Ghost. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1 and look at verse 12. And notice those Ephesians already had the Holy Spirit in them, but they weren't filled with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1, 12. That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ in whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Who's the Holy Spirit that seals you? Same book, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. Ephesians 4, 30. Same book, same writer, same context. Ephesians 4, 30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. All right, then, let's get the picture in the New Testament after Acts 2. And instead of dealing with a Jewish feast at Pentecost, we get a thing like this. Here's you. You're a vessel. And the Lord saves you. And the Lord saves you, he immerses you, puts you under the water. The water and the Spirit are one. You're baptized by the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Spirit covers you like he covered Mary, and the shadow of the Most High overshadows you, and you're born. Therefore, that holy thing born of you shall be called the Son of God, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And when you're put under that thing, then this comes in here and fills her up. And the Lord takes him a stopper, he puts the stopper in there, and seals it. And you're sealed the day of redemption. And you can't get the Holy Spirit out of there, and the Lord breaks the vessel. The Lord breaks the vessel and takes him out, then you go out with him. All right, now you see that thing right there? It's like steam. Sometimes the water level is there. You get fired up, and it begins to bubble. And you get fired up, and it's full. And the commandment is be filled. The commandment is not be baptized with the Holy Ghost. There is one commandment, either Testament, Testament commanding anybody to be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Not one verse, either Testament. There's a statement that when John the Baptist baptized, he baptized with water, and when Christ comes, you're baptized with the Holy Ghost, but there is one commandment for you to be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Now, there's a commandment for you to be filled, so they're not the same. Yes? chapter 2, it's a baptism, and Acts 4, it's not. In Acts 2? Because Acts chapter 1, verse uh, 5, says, you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. Acts 1, 5. All right, Acts chapter, yes. It's Oh, it's even worse than that. There are uh, 100 and, uh, 108 of them that are not filled. Look at 126. 
You see, everybody's taking for granted that's all the Christians. It isn't all of them. It's the eleven apostles. See verse 26? Read here. They gave forth their lots, and a lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they, the eleven apostles, all the court in one place. Now, to check that and make sure of it, look down here at verse 14. But Peter standing up with the what? For the eleven. Yeah, but the context of the talking in tongues is not 120. It's 12 apostles. 12 or Now, that isn't all. That isn't all. Here's another way you know. Look at verse 7. Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? Those 12 apostles were all from Galilee. They weren't from Jerusalem. You're reading the Acts of the Apostles, not the Acts of the Christians. <laughs> Yes. Well, I'm not sure, but a cloven tongue is like a serpent. I'm not sure, but a cloven tongue is a, is a picture of a serpent, and uh, there is that that speaketh like the piercing of a sword. I'm not, too, I'm not too sure what that is. Uh, I wrote the commentary and book of Acts, and I got some good cross-reference on it. But my book of commentary and book of Acts has been in the trunk for a year and a half, and I, I haven't checked to see if the references were. Any prophecy about this right here, uh, specifically the cloven Speaking in tongues? The cloven tongue, being baptized with that? No. The only prophecy that they'll speak in tongues in 1 Corinthians chapter 14... And that prophecy is a quotation from Isaiah. In 1 Corinthians 14, verse 20, 21, it says, In the law it is written, With men of other tongues and other lips will I speak to this people, and yet for all that they will not hear me, saith the Lord. It's from Isaiah 28, 11. Now the common teaching that the prophecy in Joel is fulfilled at Pentecost is, of course, nonsense, and I'll show you why in just a minute. What Joel prophesied did not take place at Pentecost. And Joel said nothing about tongues at all at Pentecost. Not a word. All right, Acts 2, 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit. Notice the Holy Ghost, the Spirit. You don't make a difference between the Holy Spirit and the Holy Ghost and the Spirit of Truth and the Holy Ghost and the Spirit of Promise and the Holy Ghost. The Spirit is the Holy Ghost. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And they're dwelling at Jerusalem, underline it, Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Tongues are for a sign to them that believe not. Who seeks for a sign? The Jews seek for a sign. Question? Because because Christ called them the same, turn to John 14, 15, 16. But I mean, why would they tell them the same? Why would they the same? Because they try to convince you when you got saved, you got the Holy Spirit, but you didn't get the Holy Ghost, you talked in tongues. That's how it's done. I mean, anything but the truth. All right, come and let me show it to you, John 14. I mean, anything but straight. John 14, 16, the Lord Jesus Christ speaking. John 14, 16, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you till you fall from grace. <laughs> Not quite. Even the Spirit of truth. All right, who's the comforter? He's the Spirit of truth. Let's see who he is. Verse 26, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost. Is that clear? The Holy Ghost and the Spirit of Truth and the Comforter are the same one, according to Jesus Christ. All right, John 15. John 15, 26. Now, all that trouble came from Acts 19. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? <laughs> See? Well, that isn't addressed to a Christian. And there isn't a Christian anywhere within 35 feet of that verse. But I'll tell you, when a Christian gets full of the devil, he just don't know where he's at. 
And he goes through there and says, Well, I, I believe, but have I got the Holy Ghost? Paul said, Why, you not, know you not your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which you have of God? You're not your own, you're bought with a price? Paul said, Know ye not? They didn't know. A bunch of Christians go out and say, Well, I want my Holy Ghost in my body or not. Paul said, What? Know ye not your body the temple of the Holy Ghost? You know what those sanctified, spirit filled Christians are doing? Fornicating with their mothers. 1 Corinthians 5, come to the Lord's Supper drunk, 1 Corinthians 10, and arguing about haircuts, 1 Corinthians 11, and tongues, 1 Corinthians 14. Isn't that weird? Boy, I'll tell you, if you don't know the Holy Ghost is in you, you're liable to be pretty carnal. And the Holy Ghost was in them. But they didn't know it. They're going around trying to get around to get the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Ghost. So they say it's the Holy Ghost. You ever know when the heretics get screwed up in something, their language, something goes wrong with their language? You ever notice that? Um, you ever notice these fellows, old Ballinger, you know, over there, and Evans over there in Mobile, all that baloney coming out there and saying, the church of the one body, and so he was really the church of the one body. The church of the one body. The church of the one body. What is that? <laughs> there isn't anything like that in the Scripture. You never read that in the Bible in your life. The church of the one body. The church of the one body. The church of the one body. <laughs> Well, it isn't anything. There's no church of the one body. <laughs> and then either they get about get the Holy Ghost. Have you got the Holy Ghost? The Holy Ghost. What are you saying the Holy Ghost for? You mean the Holy Ghost? The Holy Ghost. <laughs> and you ever notice how Camelites get all screwed up and say, you've got to believe and be baptized? And be <laughs> yeah, it's one demon, you know, that works for them. They all have a demon that has trouble. He's a deaf and dumb demon. He can't speak. <laughs> Book ties, book, book, book. I was on the radio one time, had a Camelite follow me, you know, for years. And, and I was talking about Camelite, 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 you know. And finally he got on the radio and he got irritated. And he said, the good doctor keeps talking about the Campbellite. Would the good doctor uh, show us what a Campbellite is? Where is a Campbellite? The next time I got on the radio, I said, there are five Campbellite churches in the area. And I gave the addresses, you know, for the Campbellite churches. And he didn't like that, and he came on, and he said, but how do we spot a Campbellite, Dr. Ruckman? How do we identify a Campbellite? And the next week I came on, and I said, well, it's easy to spot a Campbellite because they never baptize anybody. All they do is baptize. <laughs> and I said, and I said, they book, 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 baptize. And you know something? For five weeks, that guy said it right. For five weeks, he said, baptize. And then he went back to his old ways, book, book, book. Yeah. Then what well, if they're teaching the initial evidence is speaking in tongues and don't say unknown tongue? They might have a point, but you pin them birds right down, they'll tell you it's an unknown tongue, won't they? Well, that's a hypocritical make, thing to make a student sign then make a liar out of him after he signs it. That's a great bunch. Make him, make him sign a statement saying he believes in an unknown tongue. But if you see if he says unknown, then he can't get an Acts 2. And they want to line up the unknown with the baptism, see? So they say tongues, then when the kid gets in there, unknown tongue, see? There are no unknown tongues in Acts 2. They're not anywhere in the chapter. I guess he would be. And some of them are nice people. Some are good people. Some of them are saved people. Yeah, you bet your life. I mean, who wouldn't be? Well, I, that's honest. That's honest. Yeah, that's good. That's, that's the way to backslide. Paul said, labor in the word and doctrine. And Paul said, Timothy, attend to the doctrine. And all scripture is inspired and is profitable for doctrine. That's a good way to just to bypass God. Yes, the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Ten chapters in three hours. Where in Chronicles? <laughs> well, how do you do? How do you do that unless you're reading First Chronicles? Sir? Not 
You can't do it. You can't do it. He said, edify them in good words and sound doctrine. Acts chapter 2, listen. In the last days, they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust, I never said that was written on the saved people. I've always thought the body of Christ is going to apostate, not the unsaved people. All right, uh, verse uh, 5, And they were dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now, run that line by some kind of a cross-reference down to 14, and here it comes again. The Lord very clear. Verse 14, Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said to them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known to you. Run that line down to verse 22. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Run that line down to verse 36. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly. What could be any plainer than that? That's a message of the house of Israel. That isn't a message of a Gentile telling him how to get saved. Yes. Because the twelve apostles were all from that area except Judas. And with 120 disciples there at Jerusalem, they could have been from all over the country, not just Galilee. But the apostles are from Galilee. All right, verse 8 now. No, verse 6. Now when this was noised abroad, the noise got around the racket, the multitude came together and were confounded because every man heard them speak in his own language. Those tongues are foreign languages. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one another, Behold, on all these which speak Galileans, and now here we have a man in our own tongue, wherein we were born. Parthenians and Medes, Elamites and dwellers in Mesopotamia, there's east, Judea the, Judea the center, Cappadocia and Pontius in Asia, north, Phrygia and Pamphylia in Egypt, and parts of Libya and Cyrene, south, strangers of Rome, west, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, west and south, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. They were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. They're drunk on coke. <laughs> new wine is found in a cluster, Isaiah 65. New wine is found in the cluster. It isn't found in the bottle. There's no new wine in anybody's bottle. Isaiah 65, new wine is found in the cluster. And that'll be Isaiah 65. What? 65, 8. And with Isaiah 65, 8, you want to mark down for new wine in the cluster, mark down Matthew 26, 29. Matthew 26, 29, when the Lord is about to squeeze that fruit into the cup, he says, I not henceforth drink of this fruit of the vine, then the squeeze of the fruit juice into the cup. Verse 13, mocking. They're making they're making fun of them. I mean, it's like we just like we do it now. Like we said, got drunk on set them up. I mean, they knew that bunch didn't drink. They knew they didn't drink. Thirteen others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up for the eleven, lifted up his voice and said to them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known to you and hearken to, the, to my words. For these, talking to the other about the other eleven with him, are not drunken. And then he explains it rationally, taking them up their word, as ye suppose. They didn't suppose that. As ye suppose, seeing that for the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and there went four million Christians off the cliff. <laughs> let's see what Joel said, shall we? Just for a joke, let's go back and see what Joel said. Joel 2. Boy, I'm telling you, if you don't keep in mind, the second advent is right around the corner all through the early part of the book of Acts. There's no way in the world to get this thing straight. Now, I want you to take Joel chapter 2, and I'm going to give you about five minutes to read. I want you to read verse 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, and 32. And I'm going to give a $100 bill to any Christian in this building and find one mention of tongues anywhere in that chapter. What? <laughs> no, you got to find it in the original English. Joel 2. 
This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Now I'm reading what Joel said. And Peter is quoting verse 28. Now let's see you find tongues anywhere in that chapter. Oh, really? Where is that at? Verse 23 says the first month. Pentecost, not the first month. The first month is March, April. This is 50 days after that. You occur over in May. Won't work. Well, it'll be the, between the second and third. It'll be 30 days after. Well, it'll be 30 days after the 14th of March. About in there. Yeah, but where does it say tongues? Oh, that won't do. That won't do. In Acts chapter 2, they're talking in tongues. And Peter said, this is that which was spoken by Joel the prophet. That is, no, if you're going to take 28, you see where it says, your young men see vision, your old men dream dreams. Where do you, do you find that in Acts chapter 2? Sir? Well, now, do you know why those folks got so messed up? They said, when Peter said, this is that which was spoken, they thought he said this. They thought he said, this thing you're seeing is the fulfillment of what Joel spoke. And Peter didn't say it was the fulfillment. Not a word about fulfillment. Peter said, uh, this is what Joel said, and then gave it to him. He didn't say, this tongue's what Joel said. He said, this, what I'm getting ready to say, is what Joel said. And when he said, this, he's talking about Joel 2 he's got in his hand. He's not talking about the tongues. All right, let's go back to Joel chapter 2, yes. Well, if you look at it carefully, you'll find the reason why I went to Joel is because Joel is prophesying what's going to take place before the second advent. And what Peter is doing is standing up there and saying, I'll tell you what Joel said. Joel said before Christ comes, this, 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 and this. No explanation for the tongues. Yes. Question. Well, someone would probably say that uh, the fact that Joel says that the son of God was prophesying to the, to the hearers. At the time, it says that they were speaking the wonderful works of God for their ears. So that would be sort of prophesying. That would be the prophesying seeing visions? Well, that would be visions. But that was, well, they could say that that was. Uh, Where were the visions? Right, well, this was, you might, well, the initial, you might say. Initially. Okay, verse 19, Acts 2 19, where was that? Joel said that. There you go, see? There's no way in the world you can beat that thing. Then what Joel 2 is talking about is the tribulation. Now you see how we, we can't you can't beat that thing with a stick. I don't care where you come through there. When you get to Acts 1, 2, and 3, you're dealing with Christ about to come back and set up his kingdom. No way in the world you can get away from that thing. Yes. Well, they did accept it this time. That bunch right there. But the trouble with that is, these people right here, Jews, the dispersion. They're not the elders and scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees and Senate of Israel. The nation has to trust him, not the dispersed. Yes. Well, let's go back and look at that. Let's go back to Joel 2. Now, let's read it careful this time and see where folks get messed up. Now, what's happened to this bunch here talking about the wonderful works of God and these tongues, and this bunch says, well, these fellows are drunk. And Pete says, no, not drunk. They're not drunk. The third hour of day. And then he says, now listen, this is what Joel said. And then he gives them prophecies in the second coming. Because, because the Lord is coming. I mean, his, his eminent, his advance eminent right in here. All right, now, Joel 2, watch it carefully, verse 21. 
Now watch it real close. Let's believe what he said. Fear not, old land. Is that spiritual or physical? What land is that? No doubt about it, Palestine. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field. Literal or spiritual? Sure, it's literal. Isaiah 11, the beast is going to get saved. O beast of the field, for the past of the wilderness do spring, for the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, not Christians, not children of the Lord, children of Zion. They are. They are. Yeah. This is the advent. Well, let's read, Carol. Let's read and see how it comes out. Yeah, you could spiritualize that. You could spiritualize that. All right, verse 23. Be glad then, ye children of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath past tense given you the former rain moderately. When did that take place? Hath given you? And he will cause to come down to you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. Well, now, look what they've done to that thing. They say the former rain was Acts 2, Pentecost. And now he's going to give you the latter rain in the 20th century. But look at that thing. He gave you the former rain, and he's going to give you the former rain and the latter rain in March and April, the first month. Well, that's no reference to any spiritual pouring out of the Holy Spirit you know anything about. That's rain coming down on the ground. Now, how do you know that? Look at verse 24. The floor should be full of wheat, the fat shall overflow with wine and oil, and I will restore to you the years the locust have eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I set among you, and you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed, and you shall know that I am the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and my people shall never be ashamed. Now he's talking about the Lord coming right back there, and when he comes back right there, they get both rainfalls in one month. The former and the latter in one month. So there's a big rainstorm right there. Now, how many of you remember me? Give me some reference on that one time. Did I see your hands? Remember that stuff about the rain? Remember that stuff about Elijah going up there and looking out across that hill and saying, I see a man's hand? And he said, go again seven times. And the seventh time he came, boy, the cloud was black with... The air was black with clouds, and a great rain came. Psalm 68, Thou hast refreshed thy people with plentiful rain. Tell me something. What precedes that rain? What precedes it? Yeah, but I mean regards to raining. Drought. How long? Three and a half years. Be pretty good to get a double portion in one month, wouldn't it? That's Moses and Elijah right there in the middle. No rain, three and a half years. Rain comes down there. Then these are Advent references. They're not church age references. Yes. Does the rain take place? I mean, when the, when the tribulation stops and the one comes in, how much time is there? I don't know that end time. Where does that rain come in? I don't know. It's variable. That's that. Business then, the tribulation I've talked to you many times about, where it runs 2,300 days, 2,600 days, 1,800 days, and nobody knows. All right, now, we're not through. You haven't even got a good start. Verse 28. I haven't even got the verse yet. Now, here's the verse Peter quotes. Peter says, This is that which was spoken, and he quotes this verse. And it shall come to pass afterward. After what? Why, sure. It'll come to pass afterward. He's talking about after the tribulation is over. He's not talking about after he dies on the cross. It'll come to pass afterward. I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Now, wait a minute. Now, don't, don't, 
Don't run it too quick. You haven't got a chap. Pour out his spirit and who? Does that ever happen? Did it happen at Pentecost? There's no reference to it all at Pentecost. Why would anybody think that 11 Jewish disciples talking in tongues was the pouring out of spirit on all flesh? Why do you realize in Acts chapter 2 those folks had to be baptized to get the Holy Ghost they preached to? Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, every one of you, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost? God didn't pour out in his spirit in anybody in Acts chapter 2. The sense of all flesh, but he will over here. Millennial reign. Now, questions, questions. the word. Now watch the divisions here. Watch the divisions here. Acts chapter 2, or Joel 2, Joel 2, verse 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, paragraph at 12. How many have a school for your reference Bible? Didn't he put the paragraph in the middle of verse 11? I bet he broke it right in the middle. I bet you he broke that thing right in the middle of the punctuation mark. Uh-huh. Now, don't you find that rather interesting? Verse 11 is a paragraph in a, in a school field Bible. And it's right in the middle of a sentence. What? The King James Bible has a paragraph mark at verse 12, not verse 11. You want to know what the difference is, why I'm saying so much about that? Because if the, if the mark in the King James is right, that's the Lord's army, verse 1 to 12. And if school feels right, it's the devil's army. He's just blasphemed the Holy Spirit. Called the Lord's army the devil's army. How's that one? <laughs> that shows the mess you can get into in Joel 2. You get through on Acts 2 and Joel 2, you get in the biggest mess you ever saw. Now, you know why Schofield wanted to call that thing the devil's army in verse 1 to verse 11? Because he couldn't believe that was the Lord's army. Now, whose army is that in verse 11? It's the Lord's army. That's what he said. <laughs> I just go to show you being a premillennial, fundamental, soul winning, independent, Bible-believing Christian isn't all there is to it. I mean, you've got you to gotta believe it, <laughs> not just profess to believe it. All right, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're going to take a time with it now. You all, you all want to plunge in here. You haven't even got to the verse yet. I mean, we, we have, didn't finish verse 28. Well, I'd go back again. Okay, now watch it. You got your eye on your text? Keep your eye on your text. Joel chapter 2. Watch it carefully. Verse 1, Advent. Right? Verse 2, Advent. Verse 3, Advent. Verse 4, Advent. Verse 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 11, Advent. 12, repent. 13, repent. 14, repent. 15, repent. 16, repent. 17, tribulation, repent. Paragraph 18, Advent. 19, Advent. 20, Armageddon, 21, Millennium, 22, Millennium, 23, Advent, 24, Advent, Millennium, 25, Millennium, 26, Millennium, 27, Millennium, 28, End of the Tribulation, 29, End of the Tribulation, 30, The Last Year of the Tribulation, 31, before the great and terrible day of the Lord, right before the advent. Verse 32, right before the advent, the remnant. Now see that thing? And that thing will switch back and forth and back and forth. And that book says, study to show yourself approved unto God. A word of need not be ashamed, right divide in the word of truth. And the school field's division is wrong. All right, something else now. Yes. 
Well, he just couldn't believe that that was you. That's you in verse 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. That's you. Well, he just couldn't believe that was a reference to the body of Christ coming back at the Battle of Armageddon at the Advent. So he just made it the devil's army. They, doesn't he say the invading host from the north, the top of that thing? Yeah. All right, question. Never seen such a mess in all my life. Joel 2 and Acts 2. Buzz like a buzzsaw. Yes. Peter's saying, you know, where he's quoting this, uh, he's saying that it is the last day, right? Yes. Right. 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 you could say that, yeah. All right, let's go back to Joel 2. Haven't got it yet. Joel 2, 28. Joel 2, 28. This is that which Joel the prophet said. Boy, it acts to a beauty. Ain't that a beauty? <laughs> I mean, boy, you just, you know, about to get screwed up in the Word of God. That's the place to get it done. Joel 2.28, it shall come to pass afterward, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. There is anybody in this building who ever had the Spirit poured out on your flesh? Do you know why? Because the Spirit's contrary to the flesh, and the Holy Spirit will not even dwell in your body till you're circumcised from the flesh. When you got saved, the Holy Spirit came down and went inside your body and cut your soul loose from your body so he wouldn't have to touch your flesh. You're a new man in Christ. You're spiritually circumcised. You're not in the flesh. You're in the Spirit. All right, verse 28, I'll pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy Jewish. Why would somebody think that was a... Reference the body of Christ there. Your sons, not sons of God, your sons. And your daughter shall prophesy, your old men, not sons of God, not Christians. Your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids. You have any servants and handmaids? Israel did. And upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days. Can you hear with that thing on? Here, all right, okay. Uh, and upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. What else? I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth. Hadn't happened yet. Blood and fire and pillars of smoke. Hadn't happened yet. The sun shall be turned into darkness. Hadn't happened yet. The moon and the blood hadn't happened yet before the great and terrible day of the Lord come, and it shall come to pass that whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Right? Wrong. Wrong. There's no plan of salvation in that chapter. It isn't there. That's deliverance. Who's that deliverance for? You're not through yet. Finish 32. For in Mount Zion, not Calvary, and in Jerusalem, you couldn't get saved there if you tried. Christ suffered outside the gate. There isn't any reference in Acts 2 or Joel 2 to New Testament salvation. There isn't any reference in 35,000 pastors. It ain't there. You can't get delivered in Mount Zion. You can't get delivered in Jerusalem. You go to hell if you try it. Mount Zion is inside the city gate. We're outside the gate suffering his reproach. You can't get saved there. Not through yet, brother. Hold just a minute. You haven't even got a good start. 32. It shall come to pass, whoever shall call the name of the Lord shall be delivered, for in Mount Zion and Jerusalem shall be delivered, second advent, as the Lord hath said. And in the what? Remnant. Whom the Lord shall call. Now, there's a Jewish remnant, the advent when Christ comes back. And when Christ comes back, he comes into Jerusalem and comes across the Mount of Olives goes to the eastern gate in Jerusalem and sits down on the temple of Mount Zion. And there isn't any reference to New Testament salvation either passage. Now, question. Could be two of the prophesied to be the 144,000 Jews, really? The remnant? Yeah, could be. Could be. One more shot before we get through. Back to Acts 2. We've been, you've done lost the connection with Acts 2 now. <laughs> Go back to Acts 2, 16. Acts 2.16. Boy, you see what a mess a Gentile gets in when he tries to steal what God gave to Israel? 
Thou shalt not steal. Acts 2.16. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in the last days. Still future. Saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Whose sons and daughters? Verse 14, verse 5, verse 22, and verse 36. The house of Israel. Couldn't be any mistake about it. And your young men shall see vision, your old men shall dream, dream. Now, I'm not saying you won't dream. And I'm not saying the Lord could give you a vision of something. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that Pentecost for the house of Israel is not the fulfillment of that, and it, the fulfillment is up here. I'm not, saying, I'm not saying it couldn't happen to an individual. But you see, when it happens to you, you don't run to the Bible and say, Aha! Acts 2, I've got the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You don't. All right, verse 18, And of my servants and my handmaidens changed. I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath. Blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great notable day of the Lord God. And it shall come to pass, now here it is, that whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, you know what they did? They took that verse and they hooked that verse up with Romans chapter 10, verse 13. Whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And by putting those two verses together, they've been teaching Acts 2 as the plan of salvation. And the quotation from Acts 2.21 has nothing to do with Pauline blood atonement new birth. It is a reference to the Jewish remnant in the tribulation. All right. Let us stop there. I'm going to like a machine gun here. Uh, yes. Yeah, and can't you think of a verse just like that? Matthew would sound an awful like that, like that for the same people in the same time. He that should at the end, the same shall be saved. Matthew 24, 13. Which has nothing to do with you at all. Absolutely nothing. I forget what it gave you, brother. Been back here a good ways. To save? Oh, it's just probably a probably a Greek word. And when he says save, he has in reference uh, deliverance anyway from Rome, Second Advent. Yeah. Yeah. It's pre-quotation. All right, now let's stop just a minute now. Uh, now, I know I've kind of... We'll take a break. Now, I'm going kind of fast for you and kind of hard, kind of fierce. But uh, when you stand where I stand, why, you see it, see? And, and once you see, when you get in this thing in Acts 2 and Joel 2, you see just every objection in the world coming up through there to stop that thing from coming through just like it is. And I know you all love the Lord, and you're all believers, and you're trying to get the truth, and you're anxious and zealous, you know, for the truth and this and that. But you'd be amazed, you get to a certain place there where an outstanding truth is about to come through, how many times there are just 15 tracks pulled off this way to keep the thing sticking. Now, I want something to stick with you. In Acts 2, there are no unknown tongues. Now, let that stick like a knife. 1 Corinthians 14, there's no baptism, and Joel 2 has no more to do with tongues than it does the CIA. Now let those things stick with you. All right. That's all. We ever get down through that mess? All right, Acts 2.21. Now, Father, we ask you to bless upon our meeting tonight. May the Holy Spirit guide lead us in all truth. We look for understanding the Scriptures where we lack it. May we believe what you say as you say it. May the Holy Spirit show us the truth all these matters. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. All right, now, I've been coming down through this thing here for hours and hours on Joel and Acts 2. And the main thing to remember there is in Acts 2.16, when he says, This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, He's not saying 
the tongues are the fulfillment of what Joel said, because Joel says nothing about the tongues. And all he's doing is saying, this is what Joel, what Joel said, what I'm getting ready to say. The this refers to verse 17. See that? This is that. The this is a reference to 17. It's not a reference to verse 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. That was just to get, their, to get their attention. And then also in verse 17, 18, and 19, we notice that thing here is all tribulation stuff, but as do the tribulation and the advent. Now, the reason why nobody's going to believe that is because the tribulation didn't take place and the advent didn't take place. But I've taught you over and over again, taught you right, that up until Acts 7, everything is in readiness for the tribulation, readiness for the advent. And as far as that goes, that ought to be clear from Matthew. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. Remember all that stuff when Christ shows up? It's at hand. It's at hand. It is not 2,000 years away. It's right there. And when Christ shows up, all those things are conditioned for this thing right over here to take place. So he's saying at hand, at hand, at hand, at hand. Then they reject him and whoosh, slips over here and there's a gap in there 2,000 years. Now, you can't, you can't convince a shallow Bible student of that, and you can't convince a student of that who values his own opinion more than the Word of God. So it's just a mystery that you just have to get and study the Word of God and believe it, and you just can't get it. Yes. No, here we go. In the book of Matthew, when they said, Repent the kingdom of heaven's at hand, mm -hmm. if they'd have received him then, and Christ hadn't died, how would the fulfillment of his... He still would have had to die. But it would have been at hand because it had only been three years. That's pretty close. Acts 8. No, not on these. The men here, the men here lay hands on other people to give them the Holy Ghost in Acts 8. Same reason Acts 10 didn't. In Acts 10, nobody has hand laid on to get the Holy Ghost. No. But they weren't Gentiles. They were half Jew and half Gentile. They were Samaritans. No, I didn't say that. that. No, I didn't say that at all. I said until Acts chapter 7, all is in readiness for the tribulation and the advent, and they're expecting it and prepared for it, and if they'd accepted him, it would have taken place. When did they stop preaching? I didn't say they stopped preaching. Then in other words, they didn't. Well, how would they know whether it was postponed or not? All right, Acts chapter 2, verse 19. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs of the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. And the sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and notable day of the Lord come. Second Advent. And it shall come to pass that whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not just in a spiritual sense, but Joel says delivered. And when Joel says deliver, he says in Mount Zion there shall be deliverance, not Calvary. On that day, on the moon, turn to blood. Is that going to be literal blood? I don't know. I don't know what it will do. just look like it. Or if it's somebody else's blood. You know, when you have a lunar eclipse, it's blood red. Uh huh. If it's a full lunar eclipse. All right, 22. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles, wonders, signs. Well, they are. The Jews seek for a sign. So the sign, wonders, and miracles are Christ, they're Moses, and they belong to the apostles. Apostolic signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel, one, and foreknowledge, two, of God, ye have taken free will, and by wicked hands, individual accountability, have crucified and slain. Well, that's the sovereign will of God and the free will of man in one verse working right together. And notice that the man is never absolved of his own act. He's given credit for his own act. If it was just God's determinate counsel and foreknowledge of predestination, they couldn't be blamed for the death. But they are blamed for the death. You have with wicked hands, you crucified, 
you slow him. It didn't say God slow him. It said you slow him. Uh, look at chapter 3, verse 15. Notice man would reject when a man rejects Christ, he doesn't blame it in the predestination of God. He's a murderer. Acts 3.15, and kill the prince of life. He said, you killed him. Look at it again, Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7, verse 52. When a man rejects Christ, he is guilty of the death of Christ. You can't blame it on anybody's decree. Acts 7.52, which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted, and they have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one, of whom you have now been the betrayers and murderers. The free will of man right there. They're accused of murdering God's son. Or right, Acts 2.23, he be delivered by the determined counsel. God decided to deliver him. And foreknowledge, God knew he'd be delivered. You have taken, they had the act, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, set him free from death. Loose the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden. Old English, we say held. I say holden, old English, holden, and hoping for help. Brother Elliot, who comes here to chapel once in a while, that's his favorite word, hoping. That fellow hoped me a little bit. And hope, and hope yourself for some of them to come. H-O-L-P. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. All right, now, Hoden is, is held of it, death. But death couldn't keep him. For David speaketh concerning him, concerning Christ, quote, what's the psalm? 16. Psalm 16. I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I shall not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, David speaking, but speaking of Christ. So it's Christ speaking through David. Now, a lot of the times that happens. A lot of time when David is speaking about himself, he's speaking for Jesus Christ. And what he's saying about himself is not true at all. You know one thing David said about himself? He said, they pierced my hands and my feet. You remember that in Psalm 22? Nobody ever touched his hands and feet. So that thing? Psalm 22, he says, they cast lots for my garments. They never cast lots for his garments. And so sometime when David is speaking the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we call those messianic psalms, and David is not really speaking of himself. He's prophesying about Christ, and Christ is doing the speaking through it. And you remember, the, remember I read you a psalm here recently about uh, cast him in a deep pit and let cursing come upon him, my enemies, you know, like a bowel, and let Satan stand in his right hand, let his prayer be condemned, all that business. That's the Lord doing that prayer. But David's writing it down. All right, 26, therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope. Because two things. One, his soul wasn't left in hell. That will not leave my soul in hell. All right, Christ's spirit went back to God the Father when he died on the cross. Father, in thy hands I commend my spirit. His soul went down three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, and was not left in hell. That will not leave my soul in hell. Then his body went in Joseph's tomb, verse 27, Neither will thou suffer thine holy one to seek corruption. So the body didn't corrupt. The body lay in Joseph's tomb three days and three nights, did not corrupt, and Christ's soul went down the heart of the earth three days and three nights, and instead of staying in hell, went through hell, came out the other side and went up. What verse is the time that corruption is corruption in the flesh? Uh, well, one of them is, uh, is in uh, Jonah. And Christ said, as Jonah was three days, three nights in the belly of the whale. And Jonah says in Jonah chapter 2, verse 6, at the end of the verse, Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption. Jonah had begun to rot. His body had been down the belly of that whale three days. He'd begun to decompose. There's one question I know that you talked about. It references the same place, and it says the corruption of the flesh. Well, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, this body of corruption. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 52. The dead shall be raised incorruptible. And 1 Corinthians 15, 53, this corruptible must put an incorruption. Talking about a physical resurrection. 
1 Corinthians 15, verse 52 and 53. No, he finishes the atonement before he goes. On the cross, when he says it is finished, it's finished. But his reason for going to hell is something else. Turn to Hebrews chapter 9, uh, verse 26. The atonement is finished on the cross. But Hebrews 9, 26, in the context is the atonement. Hebrews 9, 26, For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world have he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Notice, put away sin. Not just to die for sin, put it away. And as it is appointed to men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. He had the sins on him, and he had to put them away. And unto them that look for him, he shall he appear the second time without sin. So when Christ became sin and bore your sins and died for them, he took them down there and dumped them and came back up without them. Question. Well, that's true. That much is true. But the trouble is there on the cross. He said it is finished. And we said it's finished. The burning is over. And it's on the cross. He says, I thirst. And it's on the cross. He says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So he suffered what you ought to suffer in hell on the cross. Yes. Something? Didn't he tell you that the Dallas men were sold off? Yes. Isaiah 53. Oh, some of them have a family. Uh, Joe Witness said the soul is the body. Presbyterians have the soul and spirit the same dichotomy. And most of them won't allow hell, so they leave it untranslated and say Hades, say it's Sheol. When they get to Hebrews chapter 9, they say to them that look for him, shall he appear the second time without any relation to sin? That's the new ASV. I was preaching all this church in the uh, Memphis uh, night before last. No, come think it was just last night I was preaching on that. Uh, where did the dead go and came down there bland the new ASV and two uh, pale-faced, pharisaical, neatly dressed, typical Pensacola Christian grade school teachers sitting there both got up and stomped out of the building and slammed the door so I shook the building. Yeah. Typical I told the pastor, I said, you know what that was? He said, what? I said, a couple of Bob Jones graduates teaching somewhere. And he said, well, you can't tell that this and that. I said, well, ask around and find out. He did. They were. They were. You can tell. I mean, you get those kind of pale, pasty faces. You know what I mean? Those folks finally buy Brent and move into that kind of church it's going to be. It's going to be a whole church full of pale, pasty faces. <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know. And sitting around there, those kind of pay of pasty faces and, and, and kind of, you know, like this. So, you know, they're all, they're all the, the demons have them in kind of a trench, you know, and they kind of, like this. <laughs> and uh, when you get up there and say something funny, they, and if it's said funny nicely, <laughs> you know what I mean? I'd rather have a chain gang for a church in that bunch. And uh, I was coming down on, uh, I was coming down on folks Amen. who, I was coming down on folks who laugh and cry over the television set and then don't laugh and cry in church. And that finished them off, brother. They went out and banged that door so I shook the building. Sunday, uh, Sunday morning, Sunday morning, Sunday morning, Sunday morning. Davidson? Yeah, he was there. He'd taken notes like a madman. I don't know what for with it, or a rebuttal, or yeah, probably, yeah, probably. We went out two and a half hours. When he is talking about uh, sin being put on Jesus and he taking our sins and dumping them in hell, it sounds, you know, it relates almost physical, something material. Uh, is there any indication of anything like that? Yeah, sure is. Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. Matter of fact, it has to be material as well as spiritual. The Bible says Christ bore our sins in his own body on the cross. So we being dead to sin might live into righteousness, 
by whose stripes or in his body you're healed. God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. We might be the right of God in him. Uh, Christ uh, bore our sin, the just for the unjust. Then Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, he was wounded, that's bodily, for our transgressions. He was bruised, that's bodily, for our iniquities. And with his stripes, that's bodily, we are healed. Verse 9, he made his grave with the wicked, that's bodily. Verse 10, it pleased the Lord to bruise him, bodily. He had put him to grief, for thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. Verse 11, he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. So it's a double offering. It's a spiritual offering of a soul uh, atoning for sin spiritually for all, once and for all and forever. And it's a vicarious suffering atonement where Christ takes your sins on his body and his, his body is punished and, and torn and beaten and bruised for our sins. It's a double offering. Back in the Old Testament, they laid the hand, the head of the animal before they killed it. They took the hand, laid the head, the head, the head, the hand, the hand, the head of that animal. That animal bore their sins. Let's go back in the Old Testament for a minute, and uh, I want to show that thing about the the physical carrying off of the sins. In the Old Testament, pick up Leviticus chapter uh, Leviticus chapter sixteen. Leviticus 16, 5. Now that teaching, that teaching that's not physical is, is theme. He teaches about in Dallas, Texas. And what his theme is teaching in Dallas, Texas is the blood of Christ is not literal and therefore it had nothing to do with the atonement and therefore since the death is only a spiritual death and a spiritual sacrifice, there's nothing physical involved in it. Therefore the physical blood of Jesus Christ had no effect in anything. That's what theme putting out in the records. Yes. Yes, sir. New English changed his blood to death. That's how it's done. All right, turn to Leviticus 16, look at verse 6. And Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make an atonement for himself and for his house. And he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord, one lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him, and he shall let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. Now that thing there, verse 21, And Aaron shall lay his both his hands upon the head of the live goat, and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgression their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat, and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man in the wilderness, and the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities. Yes. All right, Acts chapter 2, verse 27. The blood atonement of Christ, proper uh, conception atonement, shows that thing is not just God charging your sins to Christ. And it isn't just uh, God charging your his righteousness to you. That atonement is Christ dying as a substitute in your place for you as a vicarious uh, death. That is, he's dying, he's taking what you would have had to take. And when he's taking what you had to take, he's not merely taking hell, he's taking a beating. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, Hebrews 10. Uh, Acts chapter 2, verse... Uh, yeah, that's a good one, come to think of it. Turn that just a minute. Uh, Hebrews 10. Uh, here's a real tough one. Hebrews 10, 10. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body, not the soul. The offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. The body. Verse 8, sacrifice, offering, burnt offering. Is that business? And that sacrifice and burnt offering, verse uh, verse 7, or verse uh, 5, a body hast thou prepared me. Yes. In Luke, it 
he was trying to in the garden. He said, not my will, but thy will. And his sweat was a drop of blood. He was getting a picture of what he was going to have to go through. Uh, yeah. The agony. Yeah. Yeah, he's a, he's out of the foretaste of what it's going to be like to have to become sin. Yeah, that's what he's trying to get out of. He's not trying to get out of dying, but the the problem is the transfer. You can't imagine that because none of us are sinless.